Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is Dr. Martin Koldorf. Uh, Dr. Koldorf was born in Sweden. He got his PhD at Cornell University. He's currently a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a biostatistician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He serves on the scientific advisory committees to the uh, Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. Um, he specializes in the development of, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to misquote him, but he's an expert in vaccines, basically. He's been, the last two decades has been doing research and um, knows a lot about vaccines and has obviously tons of credentials. And so um, I heard Dr. Koldorf speak at the Q Ideas, not Q as in Anon, but the Q Ideas conference last spring. And I was just really impressed with how knowledgeable he was and how he approached obviously very controversial topics. Um, and then I more recently um, was hearing some stuff about this so-called, well, not so-called, it's called the Great Barrington Declaration, um, which ha it, it's kind of a group of scientists that have proposed um, a different, well, a, a, um, a somewhat different approach to addressing the pandemic. It was, it, it's a, it's an approach that re would reflect more kind of how Sweden approached it, um, elevating herd immunity and, um, targeting at risk groups, but not, they're very much against just kind of, um, uh, comprehensive lockdown measures for various reasons, which we talk about. So very, you know, controversial. And I'm the type of guy that it, you know, if, if there's somebody is saying something about somebody somewhere, I want to go to that somebody and say, Hey, just tell me what you believe, what, what are you guys talking about? Just so I get it from the proverbial horse's mouth. And, uh, so that's what this is. Uh, he, I, he, I'm not a scientist and most of you aren't either. He is. And so I, it was really fascinating talking to Dr. Koldorf and, um, especially some of the uh, the stuff I heard about him that isn't doesn't at all reflect what he believes, and so that was cleared up on this podcast. So, um, as with anything, you guys got to do your own fact checking. You got to do your own research and <clears throat> listen to various voices, and um, yeah, become uh, as ed educated as you can on these things because um, obviously they're very sensitive and um, you know controversial. So, uh, welcome to the show <laughs> for the first time, the one and only Doctor Martin Koldorf. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology of the Raw. Um, I'm here with uh, Dr. Martin Koldorf. Uh, thank you, Dr. Koldorf, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me. Great pleasure. Yeah. So as I said in the introduction, um, Dr. Koldorf is one of the architects of what's called the Great Barrington Declaration. You can um, Google it and get information about it. But it has been, um, I mean, controversial in some circles. So I have a, a couple of uh, what I guess well-known people here, the, the director of the world health organization says that, um, uh, he calls it scientifically and ethically problematic. And Anthony Fauci, uh, referred to it, or at least the, some things in the declaration as being ridiculous, total nonsense, and very dangerous saying that it would lead to a large number of, of, of avoidable deaths how how would you respond to that? I'm not a scientist. I, this is not my area at all. So here I am seeing people with credentials very much disagreeing on on some things. So um, yeah, I, how would you respond to those? Uh, I guess accusations or or maybe uh, um, descriptions of of the project. So let me just first explain very briefly what it's all about. So. Um... Uh, there's one thing we've known about this pandemic from the early on is that while anybody can be, get infected, the risk of dying or mortality uh, varies greatly by age. So older people are, have more than a thousandfold uh, larger risk of dying from COVID than the younger people. Uh, so that's an enormous difference by age. So uh, what we proposed in the Great Barrington Declaration is focused protection. So it means that uh, these general lockdowns did not protect all their vulnerable people. We know that now, lots of them died. So there was a belief, uh, including by Fauci, that uh, uh, by locking down the society as a whole, we would protect these older vulnerable people. And we now know that didn't happen. We have, I think, it's over 700,000 deaths in the US and similar in other uh, lockdown countries. Uh, so uh, 
uh, obviously we know that didn't work. So what we proposed uh, in the Great Brain Declaration a year ago is that we had to do a better job protecting older people. And we had several very concrete proposals, uh, for example, in nursing homes, uh, you should use people who have natural immunity because the residents in the nursing home, they get infected by the younger staff and the younger staff won't get very ill maybe, but they can infect those older, very vulnerable, frail uh, residents. So uh, by using staff that have natural immunity from having other have COVID, they, they won't uh, transmit it uh, to the same extent uh, and very little. So uh, uh, that was one, uh, re one, one suggestion. And then to, to reduce staff rotation in nursing homes so that each person doesn't meet too many people because the fewer people you have to deal with, the less risk you get infected if you're old and frail. Uh, we had other uh, suggestions that instead of closing schools, which is detrimental to children, uh, we should just let mm. teachers about 60 work from home and the rest can go to school. And we know from, for example, from very early on from Sweden, the first in the first wave of the spring of 2020, there were 1.8 million children ages one to five who were in daycare and school normally throughout this uh, wave, first wave, there were no masks, no testing, no uh, social distancing. If a child was sick, they were sent home. And among 1.8 million children, do you know how many of those died in COVID? Mm. Yeah. Uh, zero. <laughs> and there were a handful of hospitalizations. And the teachers mm. were at uh, lower risk from COVID than the average of other professions. So uh, there was absolutely no reason to close schools. So what, what we did with this, we didn't protect the older vulnerable people well enough. At the same time, we closed schools, which had no effect on, uh, on the pandemic, but it had enormously uh, collateral damage on children, both yeah, their yeah. education, but their social development, and also their physical health. It's not good to just sit home all day. So uh, to me, uh, this focus protection is a no-brainer. And it actually yeah. is it's nothing new and novel with it. It's uh, what uh, was in uh, the majority of uh, the pandemic preparedness plans that different countries have prepared uh, yeah. several years ago, <laughs> thinking sort of thinking through what to do in a pandemic. So it's all it's all uh, consistent with that. So when Anthony Fauci sort of uh, uh, criticizes it, he, he's basically mischaracterizing it, uh, and I think it's sort of a defensive mechanism because. Uh, what he proposed, I mean, he's the architect here in the US, uh, yeah. and what he proposed didn't work. So, uh, and he doesn't have any good arguments against uh, focus protection because why wouldn't you protect older people better? Yeah. Uh, why wouldn't you let kids go to school uh, to sort of, so that they don't take the brunt of the burden for no good reason? So, he didn't have any good arguments and therefore he started to mischaracterize it and uh, and uh, 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 there was also a lot of slander and, and those kind of things for this. So uh, yeah, I guess that's what you have to deal with sometimes. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it, has anything in, in what you said or with the Great Barrington Declaration from the beginning, has anything changed since since the, the Delta variant? Does that change anything? Um, I don't think the Delta variant has changed uh, a lot. I think it's probably a little bit more transmissible, but it doesn't really that changed the ultimate equations or the fundamental principles right. uh, of taking okay. care of it. What has changed a lot is uh, since we wrote the declaration is the vaccines came. Okay. And of course, the vaccines are an excellent tool for uh, protecting older high risk people. So yeah, yeah. Um, and most are not, uh, are not vaccinated, which is great. Uh, uh, some have already have COVID, so they don't need vac like the vaccine. But there are still people who have not had COVID and they're not vaccinated. And it's the top priority for public health right now should in the US should be to uh, uh, make sure that as many of them as possible gets vaccinated, really encourage them yeah. and uh, help them and reach out to them to get vaccinated. But instead, we are obsessed about uh, trying to fire nurses from hospitals who have had COVID and therefore they don't need a vaccine and they don't they know they don't need it because they have superior immunity you have better immunity from uh having recovered from covid than you have from the vaccine so the nurses know they don't need it but the hospitals are firing them 
uh, so we're sort of obsessed with trying to vaccinate people who have had COVID and don't need it. We're obsessed about trying to vaccinate children who are at extremely low risk, and we don't even know if there's a, a, the benefit outweighs the, the small risks with the vaccines. Uh, okay. Instead, we should focus on vaccinating those older people who have not yet uh, been vaccinated and, ha and not have COVID, both in the U.S. as well as in other parts of the world, of course. So, so you know, I mean, just to be clear, I, did, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, when I read the Barrington Declaration, it was before the vaccine. You don't have any vaccine hesitancy then, because I've I heard somebody say, "Oh yeah, they an anti-vaxer kind of movement." I said, "I don't, I don't see that anywhere." So I just want to get clarity from you. There's very pro-vaccine or more targeted vaccine, or just people that haven't had COVID need to be vaccinated, and those who maybe have had it don't need it. I heard you say, or well, I've been working on vaccines for a couple of decades. So uh, it's hard to find somebody who's more pro-vaccine than I am. I think it's <laughs> vaccines is one of the greatest inventions of mankind, together with the wheel and uh, and the plow <laughs> and uh, the writing. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I mean, the vaccines have saved millions and millions of lives. Okay. Uh, it's a fantastic thing, but. Uh, you have to also say who who do you need to vaccinate and who you don't need to vaccinate. We don't vaccinate yeah. everybody for every disease. There are we have uh, targeted vaccines. For example, we don't give the measles vaccines to somebody who is three months old. Uh, we give them later on. So uh, we don't give measles vaccine to somebody who had measles already. So yeah. it should be the same with the COVID vaccines. If you had COVID, you already have. Uh, there was a study from uh, Israel comparing uh, immunity from uh, uh, having had COVID versus uh, the vaccine. And uh, those who were vaccinated, they had 27 times higher risk of symptomatic COVID disease than those who had recovered from COVID. So uh, the protection from having had it naturally is uh, a lot better than vaccines. What the vaccines are great at is uh, uh, to reduce severe disease and death. So the efficacy of the vaccines okay. are in the 90s. So let's say, suppose it's 95%. It varies a little bit with vaccines, yeah. so we don't know the exact number, but suppose it's 95%, that means that instead of 100 people dying, we now only have five people dying. So uh, okay. uh, it doesn't prevent you to, from dying completely, but it greatly reduces the risk of dying. Uh, on the other hand, we also know now uh, from studies that uh, protection against becoming, uh, getting disease and being symptomatic, that wanes rather quickly after a few months. So uh, even if you're vaccinated, you will sooner or later get COVID and you're going to feel probably, you might be asymptomatic or you might feel miserable for a few days, but okay. with the vaccine, uh, you're much less likely to die. And that's the, I think that's the most important. Yeah, yeah, I I sure think so. <laughs> um, so I I recently heard a um, a guy on the Joe Rogan podcast, which is like the most popular podcast. So probably six, seven, eight million people listen to this episode. He's a he's a journalist. He's not a he's not a medical professional, but he seems to be very well read. And he was saying that the va the efficacy of the vaccine uh, um, wears off really quickly I, I don't i don't want to misquote him a month or two months and then after that you're gonna need another booster and then i i think he might have said again i would encourage people to go fact check me and listen to what he said that it's if you get vaccinated then several months later you think you're good to go your base is you need you need to keep getting boosters and then that raises whole other questions of whether that's um uh, realistic is that is that true? Does the vac the efficacy of the vaccine wear off after a couple of months? Or um... so it's both true and false. So the question is, what do we? What type of efficacy? So okay. if we look at the efficacy against dying, or against having severe disease, or being hospitalized for COVID, that yeah. uh, that stays. That doesn't wear off. Uh, so okay. we know that that is still in the 90s after half a year. So even okay. after half a year after getting the vaccine, uh, that efficacy is still in the 90s. So it's still very high and very good. Now, 
what is it after one year? Well, we don't know because nobody have had the vaccine, or very few people have had it uh, for a year, only those in the clinical trials. Right. How much was how much is after two years? We don't know. So right. it's too early to tell that, but since it's very strong and robust for for at least six months, it's not just going to sort of drop dead at eight and a half months. Okay. So, uh, uh, so sure, it, it provides protection for, for, for longer than six months, but we don't know exactly uh, if it stays at, in the 90-95% for five years or if it starts to wane after a year or two. That we don't know yet. So we have to wait and see. And on the other okay. hand, he is right in the sense that if you have efficacy in terms of uh, catching COVID and getting sick and feeling uh, under the weather for a couple of days, that protection wanes within a few months. Contracting COVID, so it's more just the the the, the effects and obviously death. That's that's okay. That makes sense. Um, you mentioned a couple of times, I think, uh, that you know if if you've had COVID, you have natural immunity, and can you? Um, maybe unpack that a little bit with some specifics you, well, you mentioned you know in the israel study so it because i've heard i've heard different sides of this and i'd love to get clarity on it like so so you're saying natural immunity is stronger than or just as strong as uh getting vaccinated and if you've had covid does get the vaccine help even more or does it not do much of anything and then also sorry three questions wrapped into one um, th again, does the Delta variant change anything with that? Um, cause I've also heard, I've heard a lot of stuff. I don't have anything in front of me. Okay. I'm just, that's why I brought it. <laughs> that's why I brought you on to take care of all the actual data for me. Um, uh, so we start with so, the so last I heard month. somewhere that Delta, the Delta variant is now completely different that if you got COVID with the, the, I don't know, the original COVID or whatever, it doesn't protect you against Delta, um, so if we start with the last question, uh, the Delta, you're still protected against the Delta variant. Uh, all the data I've seen, I, I have seen no data that indicates that you would not be. Uh, okay. It could be slightly uh, uh, differences, but uh, uh, the data that has come out so far doesn't show uh, any problems with that that we have to be concerned about. Uh, the two other questions are, I think, important. So if you look first, compare if you uh, if you've had COVID, natural immunity versus vaccine-induced immunity. So uh, the Israel study, I would say, is the best study on that so far. But other studies sort of confirm it. Uh, so then it depends on the. Uh, uh, so so if we compare testing positive, whether you're sick or not, you can be asymptotic and test positive. There was, I think, uh, something around ninefold difference at the point estimate. Uh, and that's not surprising because uh, if you've had COVID, uh, eventually antibodies sort of uh, uh, goes down because you can't have antibodies flowing around in your blood for 100 different diseases that you have, have been exposed to during your lifetime. So they have to sort of go down. But then, uh, then uh, if you get exposed again, it takes time for the antibodies to to sort of go into uh, to action. So you are prevented from uh, from getting sick, but uh, you might still test positive because the virus is okay. is in your body. So to me, looking at uh, preventing positive tests is not so interesting. The more interesting is preventing symptomatic COVID disease and even more so hospitalizations and deaths. So for the symptomatic COVID disease, in the Israel study shows that vaccinated people are 27 times more likely to come up with symptomatic COVID disease compared to those who have natural immunity. Uh, for hospitalizations, wow. uh, the point estimate was less, but there were fewer hospitalizations, so it, there was a lot of uncertainty around it. So we know okay. that, it's, it, that natural immunity is also better for hospitalization, but it's hard to pinpoint uh, sort of a specific number of how much better it is. And then we look at deaths so in the Israel study, uh, there were no deaths in in neither group. So whether you had natural immunity or vaccine immunity, the number of deaths was zero. So both natural immunity and the vaccines uh, works quite well for uh, preventing death. Okay. So uh, is, is it, so it's not. Is it? Are you are you more immune if you have natural immunity and the vaccine? Like if somebody had COVID say a year ago, would you say? I mean, I, I'm sure you don't want to go. You know. 
<laughs> go see your doctor and listen to your doctor, whatever. But I mean, in, in your professional opinion, is getting the vaccine even better or would you say it's not necessary? Or So in the Israel study, they looked at that also. They compared people, okay. everybody, they compared people, two groups. In one group, they had COVID and then they had a vaccine. In the other group, they had COVID, but not okay. a subsequent vaccine. So when you looked at uh, getting infections, like testing positive, then uh, getting this sort of a booster with the vaccine reduced uh, the chance of testing positive. And that's expected because as you get the booster, then you sort of, uh, uh, you activate the, the uh, antibodies again in the immune system, and then they are more okay. readily available so that you will sort of fight it off before there's enough okay. virus to test positive. On the other hand, when they looked at symptomatic uh, disease, there was no statistically significant difference. Now, okay. that, that doesn't mean that there like, could be some, because uh, maybe they, there is a slight uh, improvement. Uh, but uh, also in both groups, there were actually uh, uh, both groups were, were super well protected. So you're basically comparing okay. an epsilon risk with an epsilon half risk or something like that. So two very, very small. Okay. So uh, if you have COVID, uh, you don't need the vaccine. Uh, and uh, it's better that you let other people use that vaccines uh, who do need it, whether uh, it's an, okay. a 78 year old uh, a lady in uh, in New Hampshire who hasn't been gotten it yet, or if it's a 83 year old man in uh, in India who needs it, right. or, uh, it's better for to use it where it will make a difference. So, but it, like in America, it's anybody. There's plenty to go around, right? Or you you're thinking more globally that if um, Americans that actually don't need the vaccine, they're 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 in a sense taking it away from somebody in another country that might need it more. Or yeah, so in the U.S., everybody who wants it can get it, uh, but there are still people who haven't gotten it, and who need to older people who haven't gotten it to need it, and we need to encourage them. So that's where our yeah. public health effort should be: not vaccinated people who don't need it. But you're right, okay. uh, while there's no shortage at this point in the U.S., there is a worldwide shortage still. So there are many countries yeah. where they don't have enough vaccines. And uh, I'm sorry to tell you, but I think that uh, the big pharmaceutical companies are probably going to sell it to, if, if they can sell it in the U.S., they get a better price. And uh, they're going to sell it here, even when it's more needed somewhere else. So, so they're, oh, wow, yeah. I mean, that's not so that's a little sad but it's not surprising um, um why why is there vaccine hesitancy is there any reason why somebody uh, assuming they let's just say they haven't had covid um is there any credibility to any uh, of more of the and and i hesitate saying anti-vaxxer because there are some anti-vaxxers that are against all vaccines at all time for whatever reason, but then there's some people that are hesitant with this vaccine. Um, is there any credibility to that? I mean, why, why is somebody, why would somebody who maybe should have the vaccine, what's the reason for not getting it? Is there any legitimacy to that fear? So the way I view this vaccine is that if you are, if you're 80 years old and you get COVID, you are at high risk of dying. It's a few percentage. Um, maybe you have a 5% or 2% risk of dying, and that's sort of unnecessary to take such a risk. So the vaccine will greatly reduce that risk. So even if there is some unknown adverse reaction, uh, which is very, very small, because we know that there's no, no adverse, serious adverse reactions that are very common, we know that, but the rare ones takes time to figure out. So, but even if there are some such small risks for the older people, uh, I think it's a no-brainer. These older people should get it because the benefit clearly outweighs the risk. Right. Now, if you look at a, a 10-year-old child, for example, uh, their risk of dying from COVID if they get sick is minuscule. Right. It's less than for the annual influenza. So there it's not at all clear whether the benefits outweigh the risk. Uh, we know there yeah. are adverse reactions like myocarditis, for example, 
uh, from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. So there it's uh, still a question mark. And I think as scientists, we have to be honest about those things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so then the question comes, why is the vaccine hesitancy? And I think, uh, I, uh, I mean, th there are these anti-vaxxers who has been very vocal for, for uh, several decades, but they have never been able to make a dent into the vaccine hesitancy in this country. This is a very small group, it's a state very small group. So I think the main culprits of the vaccine hesitancy are the public health officials who are pushing vaccines on people who don't need it. Okay. So when, when CDC or uh, Anthony Fauci are saying that you should get vaccinated even if you have superior immunity, people understand that that's nonsense. Uh, and it is nonsense. <laughs> so what happens then is, why, if they're saying that nonsense about people who already have immunity, why would anybody then trust CDC when they say something else? So I think these, the not being honest with the public really destroys the trust in public health officials. Yeah. And then they're not going to trust anything they say. And then they're sort of, and that creates vaccine hesitancy. So I think uh, uh, Anthony Fauci and uh, the CDC are uh, main culprits of creating the vaccine hesitancy we are seeing in the US right now. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to uh, all the people who really need this vaccine, that's uh, uh, that hesitancy is actually leading to people dying where they shouldn't have to die. So you're saying it's the misinformation that more and more people are aware of that's causing them to just say, I, I give up. I'm not going to believe anything this guy's saying or whatever. Or, uh. Yeah, yeah. Uh. I mean, um, there was one other episode uh, in the spring where CDC uh, sort of temporarily removed the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine from the market. Right, yeah. There were some cases of blood clots in uh, younger women. And uh, they decided to take a pause of the vaccine uh, because of these blood clots. And uh, the vaccine uptake never survived after that. So the trust in vaccine went down. Uh, and I, at the time, uh, uh, I served on the CDC uh, working group for vaccine safety. And I was arguing uh, that uh, uh, there was okay to make a pause on younger women or, or younger people, but there was no adverse reactions among those over 50 and those are the ones who really need this vaccine. And this one shot, this Johnson & Johnson vaccine is only one shot, so it's very important for reaching hard to reach populations like homeless people or people living in rural areas where, they are, right. where it's hard to get to the doctor. So it's a very important vaccines to reach hard to reach groups. And by putting a pause on it, and Templar withdrawing it from the market, uh, CDC, I think, messed up uh, okay. gravely. And uh, people who needed this vaccine didn't get it. And then the confidence also so uh, uh, plummeted. But because I voiced an opposing views to CDC, uh, uh, they removed me from that committee. Oh, really? They didn't want me there. So I'm probably the only person who has ever been removed from the CDC committee because I'm too pro-vaccine. Uh, that's my guess. <laughs> well, well, I forgot. I think the numbers were something like there was like six million people that had the Johnson and Johnson, and there were six people with that had blood clots. So basically, one—I mean, literally one in a million—is that accurate? Is that statistic? Uh, that I don't know the exact there. numbers, but it was very small risk. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, but it was also very age specific. So oh, all oh, the okay. blood yeah. clots was in people below fifty. And I think there was one or two in men, but most of them were in women. Uh, right. So uh, there was nothing in people over 50. Uh, okay. So we knew uh, we knew at that time that this was, in terms of blood class, it was perfectly safe for older older people. Okay. And they were the one who needed it the most because they are the ones who are yeah. high risk of COVID. So I think uh, uh, yeah. it was not good that decision to pass the vaccine for for those over 50. Okay. What about, I've also heard that, and I'm going to mispronounce this, but is it, I want to say mitochondria or some kind of heart condition that young, healthy males 
are getting from the vaccine? I mean, getting, I say, you know, a few have gotten it, at least enough that has raised some concern. Is that, is that, what's the name of that? Am I, is it? It's uh, myocarditis. Myocarditis. Yeah, that. Is that, so it's uh, inflammation of the heart. So is that true? What's, what's going on there with, I think it was young teenage boys or younger men. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, we didn't know that when the vaccines were approved, but that's one of the adverse reactions we have found out since. Uh, okay. So, uh, and that's for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, is it a high percentage that are getting that? Or, I mean... No, I think it's uh, uh, in one in 5,000 or one in 10,000. So it's a very rare disease, a very rare okay. adverse reactions. Uh, the, so... Uh, uh, but that's uh, that's predominantly in uh, uh, in uh, in younger younger people, yeah, mostly and uh, more men than women. So uh, it's highest uh, in uh, in teenage boys and uh, uh, men in the twenties, uh, maybe up in the thirties. Okay. But again, it's it's not uh, it hasn't been found to be a risk uh, in older people, uh, at least not not yet. So. Would that be a cause for hesitancy for a teenage, a young, healthy teenage boy of getting it? Um, or I guess you have to weigh out how at risk is this person from COVID and how at risk is he with the vaccine? Um, yeah, so uh, if you are a 15-year-old boy or 25-year-old young man, your risk from dying from COVID is minuscule. It's very, very small. So uh, it's not at all clear that uh, they would benefit from the vaccine. Okay. And that the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, for okay. the for a seventy-five-year-old man, for yes, for sure, absolutely yeah. they benefit. They should absolutely get the vaccine. Right. Okay. I I heard that Israel. I was supposed to go to Israel. I'm I'm planning to go to Israel next June. But I heard they're requiring. Not only vaccine, but three shots of the vaccine to even get in. Like, they, I think they consider you not even vaccinated until you've had at least one one booster. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've got three, four teenage kids. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, do we. Yeah, it's just it's an interesting question. Uh, there does seem to be unknowns with how many boosters and all this, you know. Um, w what about. Um, the, 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 you know, so I've heard again, I've heard, I can't cite any actual study here, but that, um, the only, the only thing that will prevent variants, like constant mutations is if everybody got vaccinated. So as long as people aren't vaccinated, they, they, they may have some kind of natural immunity, but they can still host the vaccine cause variants to keep spreading so until almost everybody's vaccinated other variants are going to keep being developed some that might even be more deadly than you know some of the ones we've seen is that is is there legitimacy to that or uh so all viruses mutate so the fact that covid is mutating or the sars cov2 is mutating is expected, so that's not strange. Uh, when there's mutations, uh, if there's a mutation that makes it more transmittable, uh, transmissible, that will that uh, mutation will have an advantage, so that might sort of take over, uh, competing out other variants. Uh, but uh, uh, to blame it on those who are not vaccinated, that's not right. Uh, first of all, those who have had COVID uh, spread it much less. So we know that even if you're vac uh, even if you're vaccinated, you, you can still be sick and you can transmit it to others. So to sort of blame it on uh, uh, transmissions on those who are not vaccinated but have already natural immunity is complete nonsense from a scientific point of view. So that's just a political stunt uh, that some people are doing. Now, what effect does vaccinations have on mutation rates? That's a good question. What effect does the lockdowns have uh, on mutation rates uh, or, or new variants? Uh, that's also a good question. It's it's uh, uh, it's a difficult thing to uh, to sort of uh, to know for sure. So it's maybe better not to speculate. Uh, 
but uh, okay. both uh, both uh, both the vaccines and uh, uh, and lockdowns could potentially sort of uh, generate new variants uh, that sort of escape the yeah. vaccine or escape the the lockdowns uh, that are more transmissible because of those things. But whether that has happened or not, I don't know. And yeah. uh, so, so it's, it's it's a theoretical thing that could happen, but uh, right. I don't know if it okay. actually did happen. So you're, I mean. You- it, in your view, as you kind of look ahead the next year or two, is it is it likely or logical that between people getting COVID, getting natural immunity, people getting vaccinated, that this thing will eventually die, die off? Is that too simplistic, or I mean, or do we just not know? Um, because I, I mean, I, it's only a matter of time until everybody's either had the vaccine or had COVID. And those breakthrough cases, but those are still a lot less you know, then like if somebody has been vaccinated, it seems like they could break through, but it's obviously minimized that they would get it again. Yes, I think uh, it will die off. Uh, all pandemics end, this pandemic will end. Uh, the virus will not disappear. So we will move from the pandemic stage when we have these waves of a lot of people getting sick yeah. and, and dying until we get to an endemic state where we will sort of live with the virus. Uh, and what happens, and I mean, there were, uh, and, and we reached that endemic stage when we reached herd immunity, when enough people have immunity. Now, uh, when the vaccines came out, we were hoping that the vaccines would help with that. But mm-hmm. that's not going to be the case because it, while well, it protects well against the death, uh, the, the, the protection against infection and transmission wanes off very quickly in a few months. So, right. uh, so uh, we're not going to reach the endemic state. So everybody's going to get uh, like the, almost everybody's going to get COVID disease. Some will be asymptomatic. Mm-hmm. Some will have symptoms. Uh, but whether you're vaccinated or not, everybody's going to get it. And it's when you get it, it's better to have had the vaccine when you get it the first time. Okay. Uh, but what's going to happen is that these waves are going to end at some point, and. Uh, but they will still circulate, and then you're going to be exposed. And as you're exposed, you might be either asymptomatic or you might have a mild uh, mild cold or something, a mild disease. But every time you're exposed, so sort of the, the immune system sort of uh, gets uh, uh, gets uh, uh, nauseous there, so you sort of uh, boost the immune system a little bit. And uh, that's how we're going to live with it, just like we do with the previous four coronaviruses that are circulating, mm. uh, has circulated for, for, for at least 100 years in society. Yeah. And, uh, but then uh, you're going to have somebody who is 93 years old uh, in a nursing home and their immune system is deteriorating and uh, they might die from it, just like they might die from having influenza or from some other uh, common virus, because their immune system has deteriorated and they, they, is, their body is no longer able to sort of fight off these viruses. So that's something that we've had, uh, we've always had that these older frail parents, yeah. uh, pac- uh, patients will, will often die from uh, a virus that the rest of us will easily fight off. Right, right. When do you think, just based on the numbers, we'll reach, this sounds a little confident, but the end of the pandemic or the the transition from it's a pandemic to now it's just an endemic and now we're just, we have to live with this. Do you feel like we're close to that or are in it or is this a year or two out? Just based on, again, how many people are getting vaccinated, how many people have had COVID? So my guess is that in the U.S. we're going to have a winter wave again. Uh, okay. But I don't know how big it's going to be. I think the mortality will be less because of the vaccines. Right. Uh, but it's not the vaccine is not 100% foolproof, and some people haven't gotten the vaccine, so there will be, I, I guess, mortality is my you know, my guess. I don't know how big the wave will have, but it also depends on geographically because there are some areas of the U.S. who have already had uh, 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 a lot of this, so they have, there's a lot of natural natural immunity. Uh, but then there's other areas where they have uh, have had less, so there's less natural immunity. So they will probably be hit harder this time around. And we can also mm-hmm. compare, for example, New Zealand and Australia. They sort of kept it out 
uh, for a long time, but now it's sort of exploding there. Uh, so okay. they they are nowhere they, they are nowhere close to uh, to the the endemic state. But okay. uh, other countries, uh, some parts of the U.S., I think, as well as uh, some of the countries in Europe, are much much closer to the endemic state. And some have well, some uh, have already have reached it. I don't know. I I know Australia. They're they, they've got a lot of like vaccine mandates. It seems I got a buddy who I was just talking to in Australia and. He's like, I think close to 80% of the population has been vaccinated. There's, I mean, the, as, as far as a country that has been vaccinated, they're among the highest, I think. What, why is it exploding there? Well, the vaccine will protect, protect against death and, and hospitalization and serious disease. Okay. But uh, the protection against uh, symptomatic disease and presumably then transmission uh, wanes off after, uh, after a number of months. So right. uh, that means that you get the vaccines that maybe sort of push the the the, the way forward in time, but uh, eventually, uh, eventually it's gonna it's gonna uh, uh, come yeah. there. And we're seeing so, increasing so deaths. So de deaths ha hasn't increased there. It's just people getting it, and that's because, like as you said already, you can get it with the vaccine. You're just their symptoms are going to be a lot less. Yeah, so, I mean, there are um, some deaths yeah. in Australia also, I think, so, and, right. and I expect to see more because the vaccine is not 100% effective. But okay. uh, the more people who, the more people of the, the more of the older people are vaccinated, the less death they're going to have in Australia. Okay, and I think the same thing in Israel too. I mean, they're heavily vaccinated, and we saw a big spike more recently in, in people that got the got COVID. Didn't not again. I didn't die from it but that i guess that would just prove your point that you can still very easily get it you just your symptoms are going to be minimized yeah another example is iceland because it's sort of a small island country mm -hmm. and they have among the highest vaccination rates in the world mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this summer they still had a wave of uh, of covid right yeah <laughs> and i wouldn't be surprised if they have another one this winter okay okay Man, uh, well, I, I'm running out of questions. You've answered so many of the questions that I had. This has been so helpful. Um, so I guess, so I mean, I guess you've already said it. One of my questions was um, the concept of herd immunity. I know that's been, uh, well, it's been debated and it's been politicized. And if I remember, I mean, as you know, in the U.S., everything's so politicized. And I remember, I think a year ago, Donald Trump seem to talk positively about herd immunity and therefore all the anybody who was against Trump kind of went against the concept which to me it's like well is it is it legit or is it not so so you I mean you've seen you're very that that that's a valid concept this idea of herd immunity that when an, a certain percentage of the population gets it things will start to wane and and um yeah, so it's been very weird as an, an epidemiologist to uh, uh, frustrating to look at this debate because herd immunity is a well-established scientific phenomena just like gravity. So to discuss whether herd immunity exists is like discussing whether gravity exists. Uh, so it's sort of ridiculous. And, and we will, re and people are talking about herd immunity strategies, but that doesn't, I mean, every, whatever we do, we will eventually reach herd immunity. And uh, and when we reach herd immunity, that's when it's not going to go away, but that's when we we reach the endemic stage. Okay. So these discussions, uh, whether to have a, a herd immunity study or not, is like you have two pilots in an airplane thinking they're going to land the plane and say, well, should we use a gravity strategy when landing the plane or should we not? <laughs> I mean, gravity is going to ensure that the plane land, comes down to the ground <laughs> sooner or later. It's just a question of landing the plane with uh, without uh, uh, in a in a safe manner without people dying. So it's it's yeah. really weird. This whole discussion about uh, it. it's really absurd. Okay. For for and, me, and, as and know, the others, I understand that yeah, lay people yeah. have never heard of this before, and is for them it's a new and interesting concept. But for me, as an ethnologist, it's it's absolutely it's very strange. Well, in other countries have a. I mean, very much adopted. Is it is it Sweden that from the very beginning was had that kind of at the forefront of its policies, or maybe it wasn't Sweden? Was it Sweden? 
Um, well, Sweden uh, didn't, for example, uh, close all the schools in the first wave. Uh, and then the rest okay. of Europe followed during the 2020-21 with not closing the schools. So uh, Sweden was did much less of the lockdown measures than uh, right. okay. uh, other. They were much, much less strict. Um, they were also really good at, uh, at uh, focusing when the vaccine came, they really focused it on the oldest people to get those vaccinated first. Uh, right. Strict rules about the order of vaccinations to, to vaccinate older people first, together with the healthcare providers and nursing home staff. So they did okay. a good. So they, they did a good job with that. Uh, uh, they didn't do a good job in the beginning of the pandemic of, of protecting the nursing homes, especially in the Stockholm area. But uh, so so yeah, they took a much lighter touch when it comes to general lockdowns and they didn't close schools uh, for ages one to fifteen. And uh, they now have uh, better results than uh, many of the harsh lockdown countries in Europe. And it's not it wasn't just Sweden because Denmark and Finland and Norway also had a much lighter approach when it comes to lockdowns. Okay. And also, they also they did even they did even better than uh, Sweden in, in in many ways. When it comes okay. To okay. Well, one last question I forgot to ask. Um, on the on the Wikipedia page of the Great Barrington Declaration, so this is Wikipedia. <laughs> I don't I don't normally go here, but they um, they said the 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 Great Barrington Declaration was funded by the American Institute for Economic Research, a libertarian think tank, and then they talked about all the you know the Koch brothers and and other people who have funded this, and somebody. Um, who was who was very not really into libertarian thinking pointed that out to me and said well this whole thing is look where the money is but then i read somewhere that you denied or you said that's i don't know you you kind of gave a different perspective on the funding of the declaration so can i get clarity on that i, I don't even know how much it matters personally but yeah well, uh, if one of your listeners uh, edit Wikipedia pages, maybe they should go and uh, change that because that's completely wrong. That's uh, misinformation errors. Uh, yeah. Nobody has paid us any money for the Great Barrington Declaration or the work that we do uh, on the focus protection. Um, I have I'm one of the few scientists. Uh, who work on vaccines and drugs who are who has never received any funding from the pharmaceutical industry uh, uh, because I think that gives a conflict of interest so uh, uh, so this is complete nonsense uh, we were at the, it was uh, uh, it was signed at the American Institute of Economic Reasons we were there for other reasons to do some media interviews me and uh, Dr. Uh, Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford and Dr. Sunita Gupta from Oxford and while we were there, we decided to write this uh, declaration and uh, sign it and uh, post it. But uh, suppose we instead have met at Starbucks and written <laughs> it there over a cup of coffee. Would Wikipedia have written that it was sponsored by uh, uh, Starbucks? Okay. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's complete nonsense. So uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know what well, to do. It looks about like it. it's kind of people can say whatever stupid things they want, and yeah. it's so hard to do anything uh, about it. Yeah. That's welcome to my world. Um, because <laughs> um, then they they say in this group denies climate science, and they kind of try to connect. They try to make it out to be that the group that funded it is this far right wing science denying whatever organization, and therefore you know connected dots. Um, so I, I don't I don't hear you denying climate change, but. <laughs> no, and I think um, this uh, AIR, uh, they don't, they they do uh, economic research. It's like a free market uh, uh, economic research institute, and uh, uh, they don't deny climate change. And uh, uh, I think they received uh, a sixty-eight thousand dollars for from the Koch, some Koch Foundation to do it some uh, for some conference they organized just uh, several years ago. Okay. But if you want to connect to me, uh, GBD with the Koch brothers, there's much closer connection because I work for Harvard University and Harvard has received millions and millions of dollars from the Koch <laughs> fund, uh, uh, brother foundations as uh, yeah. Jay works for, Jay Barashaya works for Stanford and they also have received millions of dollars. So okay. there's much more uh, closer connection, not, not for any of our, our research, it's for other people at the universities. Right. But if okay. you want to do, if people want to do those at Hanuman attacks, 
uh, they could even do a lot better, I think, than uh, the silly yeah. things. But there was some okay. kind of, uh, there was, uh, I think, a journalist in, or not a journalist, but some guy in the UK who, uh, he was, he's a conspiracy theorist uh, denying like the 9 11 uh, uh, oh, wow. thing. And then uh, he, I guess he got a new interest about the Great Dining Declaration and was posting a lot of nonsense that then other picks up, okay. pick up on. So, okay. I mean, if, uh, okay. they sh uh, uh, if people have their arguments, uh, they should discuss the content of the Great Bank Declaration. So right. then that's, yeah. uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, that with any other scientist. Yeah. Well, Dr. Kolder, I've already taken you uh, an hour here. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on. I know your time's uh, very precious and valuable. I appreciate your clarity and just your uh, just your humility and wisdom and in, in all these really touchy topics. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure talking to you. So. Okay. Take care. You too.